Good evening, fight fans. You are listening to the Rattledge in Broadcasting Network History of Heavyweight Boxing, Chapter 15, Lennox Lewis. I'm your host, the mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Rattledge. And joining me, as he has for the previous 14 chapters, and will continue to do so until we wrap up this series, ladies and gentlemen, the punchy pugilist, Pat Mullen, how do you do, sir? Well, it's, you know, quarter past the hour. Uh, that's a lie. It's not a quarter past the hour. I don't know what time it is. Uh, I'm feeling great, personally. Fantastic. What are your favorite, like, top three memories of Lennox Lewis? Like, when someone in the middle of a conversation about boxing, life, the universe, and everything says, Lennox Lewis. I'm, I'm going to keep saying Lennox Lewis because apparently he won't correct me if I say it that way, but it, the real pronunciation of his name is Lennox Lewis. But, like, t- you know, when someone is named Tamara, but they want you to pronounce it some other way, I can't do it. Like Tamara? Yeah, Tamara. That, that is exactly it. I can't. I actually know a Tamara. Do. I can't do it. So, so my top three favorite Lennox Lewis memories, um, really briefly, because we'll cover all of them on the show, but uh, one of them is the Halloween night fight against Razor Ruddick. One of them is the uh, first fight against Hasim Rahman in Africa. And one of them would be the, uh, not at the time, but in, in the when I got to see it, the Vitaly Klitschko fight. He, uh, I kind of view him after going through his record, watching his videos, hearing his interviews. He's kind of like the gentleman fighter. I, I, I feel like the best way to view Lennox Lewis is through the prism of his fight with Tyson. Because on the one hand, you had, you had the guy who will, co- t- will, will come to know as really what everything the sport of boxing should be about. He was a good technical boxer. He had power. He had grace. He had style. Um, he he was a gentleman sportsman. You know, he's everything that everyone should have liked about a professional athlete and a heavyweight champion. But everyone loved Tyson because he was a crazy animal. <laughs> you know? And it's like... I could just see like, why Lennox Lewis felt the way that he did and why he wanted that fight so bad and wanted to knock Tyson out so bad. Um, because, you know, we had this romance with Tyson because of who he was and what a dangerous person he was. And isn't that always the way? Don't we always prefer the dangerous one versus, the you know, the safe, good choice you can bring home to mother? Um, and the, and that that's... I think a lot of the story of Lennox Lewis, also a couple of really bizarre, bad turns in his career. Not too many. He had more wins and losses, obviously, but certainly some really weird moments in the career of Lennox Lewis. I'll give you another word here before we get into it. Um, I, I think that's very fair. I think it's just one of those things where Mike had that magic as a destroyer, even if it wasn't against the most elite level of competition. And Lennox, who did fight the most elite level of competition but didn't exactly blow them out of the water the way Mike did, didn't capture the public imagination the way uh, we saw from Tyson. And that will, despite the level of opposition, always hurt somebody's box office and mainstream appeal. And when you're the heavyweight champion of the world, you have to have mainstream appeal. And, you know, that, that hurt Lennox in the sense, you know, that he didn't do what Mike did even though he fought a better level of opposition. Yep, life's not always fair, even to the best of us. Lennox Lewis was born on September 2nd, 1965, in West Ham, London, England, to Jamaican parents. Come on, Lewis, you lions. Lewis often fought with other children, and at the age of 12, Lewis moved with his mother to Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. Oh, Canada. In school, Lewis excelled as a three-sport athlete, playing football, basketball, and soccer, but his true passion in athletics was boxing, which he began at age 13. Lewis won a junior world championship in 1983 and represented Canada in the 1984 Olympics, but lost in the quarterfinal round to American Tyrell Biggs, a loss he would avenge in the pro ranks with a third round KO. Rather than turn professional, Lewis chose to pursue his dream of an Olympic gold medal and fulfilled it in 1988 at the Olympics in Seoul, South Korea, by defeating American and fellow future champion Riddick Bowe in a controversial fashion. Lewis, uh, why don't you tell me about that fight? Um, I watched it earlier, but I want to get your opinion on it. What uh, what all happened in their Olympic match? 
Uh, so, you know, in, in that fight, Lewis, in the first round, fought very tentatively and let Bo kind of assert himself and be the aggressor and land uh, uh, basically a two-to-one clip uh, against Lewis in that first round. And in the second, after much prompting from his corner, Lewis, for lack of a better way to say it, woke up and just really unleashed an offensive torrent on Bo, who just wasn't prepared for it. And Lewis just landed, 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 earned a standing eight count from the referee at one point because he was landing very cleanly without any kind of uh, opposition from Bo. And he continued to press his advantage. And, you know, instead of a second standing eight count, the referee stopped the fight, uh, which at this point in time is very uncommon because normally a fighter will be given multiple eight counts if they don't go down. But And Bo had never gone down, but he didn't receive multiple eight counts. He was stopped in, immediately in the second round when the referee deemed that he had had enough. And the decision was awarded to Lewis by TKO. But a lot of people thought Bo should have been given the benefit of the doubt and, and continued on. Yeah, that's certainly going to come back to bite Lewis <laughs> later on when we get to Oliver and McCall. The idea of, I can still go. No, you can't. <laughs> what? Lewis was courted by many American-based promoters but felt put off by their recruiting tactics. Lewis would instead leave Canada and return to England as he felt Canada didn't have the infrastructure that could cultivate his skills effectively and that as a native Briton, he could succeed there. Which, in saw- hindsight, he was halfway not wrong about. Mm-hmm. Just to just to put it out there. Well, explain. What do you mean? Uh, well, Mark, how many great heavyweights from the nation of Canada did you see during the nineteen nineties? I'm gonna go with none. I would give you one. I would give you Razor Roddick. Mm-hmm. But I would give you no others. Right. Thus, you would kind of safely assume that based on that versus the production of heavyweights from the United States, from the Soviet Union, from, uh, you know, even, you hate to say it, but even Eastern Bloc states later on in the late 90s, you know, Canada was not exactly a superpower when it came to heavyweight production. Right. Makes sense. So he begins his career in earnest. He slices through about 20 guys uh, collecting British titles along the way. The uh, British and European heavyweight title, the Commonwealth heavyweight title. Uh, He fights notable names of Derek Williams, Tyrell Biggs, Mike Weaver, Gary Mason. Um, He wins a European heavyweight title from uh, Jean Mia, it's a Shane. Um, he fights Ozzy I'm sorry, can, you, can, you, can you say that again? No, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> and then he continues his uh, reign of destruction um, against these folks until he finally gets to his 22nd fight. Um, the aforementioned Razor Ruddock. So he comes in uh, 21 and 0 with 18 KOs, and he's matched with the highly touted Donovan Razor Ruddock, coming off two spirited fights with Mike Tyson to determine the WBC's number one contender for the heavyweight championship. Uh, so tell me about this fight. This this well, ends Lu- in the second round, but <laughs> yeah. tell me about those two rounds. Lewis was entered into this fight as an underdog, um, largely based on Ruddock's success in his two fights with Tyson, where even though he came out with a loss, he had performed better essentially against anybody against Tyson than anybody with the exception of Buster Douglas had. And so as as a result, because Lewis had largely fought, I don't want to say nondescript, but not exactly the world's toughest opposition. um, People favored Ruddick to run through Lewis and eventually just make a run for the belt. And (laughs) what happened on Halloween night, 1992 wound up being the the total opposite of that because Lewis, in one of those moments where a fighter just puts all his potential together, just did so against Ruddock and really battered him and hurt him and stopped him in violent fashion to pretty much put himself on the map as, hey, everybody, I'm here, I'm for real, 
and I might, in fact, be the best heavyweight on the planet. So, as we were saying, the fight was seen as half of a tournament between the four best active heavyweights as Tyson was serving a prison sentence at the time, as we've discussed earlier in previous podcasts. The other half of this tournament saw Riddick Bowe beat Evander Holyfield, which we talked about, for the Undisputed Heavyweight Championship. And what should have set the stage for Lewis versus Bowe as a professional fight, instead we got a circus. Rather than fight Lewis, Bo was coaxed by his manager, the controversial Rock Newman, into throwing the WBC heavyweight title belt in the trash, famously saying if Lennox wants to be a garbage picker, he can go and pick this belt out of the garbage. We covered all this in the Evander Holyfield show. Oi. <laughs> Boy, yep. uh, Bo would instead defend the WBA, IBF, and lineal titles in a rematch with Holyfield, while Lewis would be recognized as the WBC champion by virtue of, of his victory over Ruddock. For the first time since 1988, the titles were again fractured, and Mark's heart was broken. Lewis, however, was determined to make his championship mean as much as Bo's, but was faced with significant hurdles. Lewis's championship was not the lineal championship, and of the three recognized sanctioning bodies he held, one belt compared to Bo's uh, two. In Britain, Lewis was still in the shadow of beloved heavyweight Frank Bruno, the most popular athlete in England at the time. Despite being born and spending the first 12 years of his life in England, Lewis was viewed as a Briton of convenience and seen as a Canadian by the UK fans. We're, we're fun in, in, in the human race. So, number 23, uh, he fights Tony Tucker on May 8th, 1993 at the Thomas and Mack Center, and he retained and uh, he re- wins a 12-round decision, unanimous decision, retaining his WBC heavyweight title. So, tell me about this fight Pat, what did you think of the Lennox Lewis Tony Tucker fight? Well, you know, at the, at the time, Tucker was still very much thought of as a legitimate contender. Um, Tucker, to this point, is best known for having given Mike Tyson probably the the toughest fights of his career up until uh, his loss of the title and Razor Ruddock. But when he launched his comeback after he had. Uh, Resigned with Don King, he made he made a, a really strong effort and wound up going undefeated after that loss to Tyson, beating guys like Orlin Norris and Oliver McCall and Frankie Swindell until he got to Lewis. And there was a chance that people thought, okay, he's gonna, you know, he's gonna he's gonna come back and uh, fight in hard fashion. But Lewis instead actually performed against Tucker better than anybody ever had. He dropped Tucker twice in that fight, which nobody had ever done before, including Tyson. And, you know, Tucker at that point is 34, so he's seen as on the other side of his career. But he had looked good in all his fights prior to that. And Lewis dropping him twice for the first time ever was seen as Lewis making a big statement. Lewis will forever be in search of the respect he'd had always been due. That's going to be a reoccurring theme throughout his career. And this next one is an example of that. Lewis sought out an opponent he knew he would have to beat for recognition in England. In October 1st, 1993, in Cardiff, Wales, Lewis would square off against Frank, uh, Frank Bruno, and he would win a TKO victory in the seventh round, retaining his WBC heavyweight title. Pat, Frank Bruno, Lennox Lewis. This was one of the biggest sporting events in the UK that there has ever been. Um, Frank Bruno, who we've talked about previously on the show, not in great detail, but in some detail, had challenged for the heavyweight title or versions of it already, as he had been seen as Britain's greatest hope for the title since they had never won it back for the, from the time of Bob Fitzsimmons. And Frank was a big puncher who looked like he was made out of uh, stone. He, he fought hard, but unfortunately... He had fallen short against Tim Witherspoon, and he had fallen short against Mike Tyson, and even even though he had hurt Tyson early in their fight. But Frank, who had fought such a fan-friendly style and endeared himself to the British public, even though Lennox was seen as the better of the two fighters at the time by most boxing insiders, England was Bruno's turf. And like you said, Lewis was seen as a Briton of convenience, and that didn't help his cause when he did fight Bruno because Bruno was the overwhelming crowd favorite when they stepped in. And you would think a fight like this would take place in Wembley Stadium, but there was some concern over rioting or fan reaction. So instead they did it in Cardiff, Wales, where things would be a little more uh, controlled. 
And he, even in this fight, Bruno acquitted himself well because early on he took the he took the aggress he took the aggression to heart and went after Lewis at first and was doing well. Lewis had to take time to come back into the fight and did so by working behind his jab and exposing Frank's weakness when you threw combinations at him. And his his Frank's biggest weakness is really that when you threw combinations at him, he wouldn't punch back. He would wait to he would wait till you finished a combination to start punching back. And what Lewis would do is exploit that, hurt him, and then go to work again. So Lewis gets a seventh round stoppage here against Frank when he really just does a number on him on the ropes and stops him and kind of makes himself unquestionably the UK's best heavyweight. But at the same time, it's that one of those things where you've beaten the public's favorite. Now there's going to be that perception of the public where, yeah, some of them will say, okay, yeah, Lennox is better, but I don't like him and I'm not going to root for him because you just beat my hero. Right. And that's something Lennox is going to have to deal with for the rest of his career. Yeah, he has a very always the bridesmaid, never the bride vibe going, um, which, is, which is such a shame because he's such a great athlete you know, and, and a good dude, just a generally good dude. Um, I want to take a moment and just uh, tell people a little bit how the sauce is made here. Pat and I collaborate before the podcast starts on notes. Just kind of go over the structure. Uh, Pat sends me a lot of details and fights to watch, and we go over them. We make notes, and we it's one of the few podcasts where we actually construct a script of sorts just to kind of guide us so that we're not kind of hemming and hawing and all over the place. And a great tool to do all of that is Grammarly. Grammarly's AI-powered products help people communicate more effectively. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar, punctuation, and spelling mistakes while also catching contextual errors, improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. Pat, have you heard of this great tool, Grammarly, that would help us with our notes here for the show? I have, and as someone who's a lot of the time pressed for time when he's writing his notes for you, um, Grammarly is such an excellent tool to help me out with trying to incorporate the best possible tools I can offer you with what I type. Um, Grammarly intercedes and really does a great job of correcting things I would have otherwise made a mistake on. So Grammarly has really been a, an awesome tool for us to use through the duration of this podcast, and I can't recommend it enough. Absolutely. So for you listeners of our history of heavyweight boxing podcast and all the great podcasts here on the Rattle Legion Broadcasting Network that are brought to you by the W2M Network, Grammarly is offering a free download of the Grammarly software. So go to getgrammarly.com slash W2M Network. That's G-E-T-G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash W2M Network. You can uh, download Grammarly for free and take advantage of their 30-day offering. Isn't that great? You can get you can try out Grammarly, try out all their uh, their products, and see how well it might help your life while writing on the web. And we spend so much time on the internet uh, as a culture, writing and tweeting and, e and emailing and Facebooking. Uh, it can't but help you. So go to getgrammarly.com slash W2M Network today to give their software a chance using their free offer. All right, uh, moving on. So... He fights Phil Jackson next. He beats him in eight rounds with a TKO at the uh, convention hall in Atlantic City. He retains his WBC heavyweight title. And here's where things get weird. <laughs> it's after this. Uh, so that's May of 1994. Uh, a few months later, in September of 1994, he will, before a hometown crowd uh, of sorts in Wembley Arena in London, England, he will fight... Oliver McCall uh, and re and uh, defend his WBC heavyweight title. And I just watched this fight. I've watched it a few times now that I think about it. And every time I see he can get knocked down in the second round, it's a vicious knockdown. But, and, and one might say, had the fight gone longer, maybe, maybe Oliver McCall legitimately finishes Lennox Lewis here. But what happened instead is controversial, to say the least. Lennox Lewis beat the count. Lennox Lewis got up. Lennox Lewis was, Lennox Lewis was able to walk towards the referee, show him his hands, 
say he's ready to fight, and the referee was like, no, you're not. Which is the referee's purview? That's what they're there for, to save the fighters from themselves. In this particular case, I would like to know what the referee thought he was looking at when he looked into Lennox Lewis's eyes, because... <laughs> He decided Lennox Lewis was done, and, Lewis, and Lennox Lewis, in his own imitable fashion, kind of went, Mark! Um, which I believe is Canadian-British for, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> Pat, what went wrong here? Um, you know, Oliver McCall has one of my favorite nicknames of all time, the Atomic Bull. And part of the reason here in that nickname is because throughout the entirety of his career as a heavyweight through the 90s, 2000s, even the 80s, never once was he knocked down or visibly seriously hurt. For you to fight at that time and to have that distinction is pretty insane. Secondly, Oliver McCall was secondly best known for being the regular sparring partner of Mike Tyson when Mike was at the height of his powers. And there are some vicious gym wars that you can watch between these two guys um, from Mike's peak where Oliver just takes everything he has and goes right back at him and Oliver's fighting Lennox as uh, a seemingly huge underdog but Lennox makes a fatal mistake Lennox under the tutelage of Pepe Correa at this time who's his head trainer stands in the pocket with Oliver and throws a right hand while dropping his left which is a fundamental big mistake McCall, who tries to avoid Lennox's right hand, makes what is also seemingly a mistake that turns out really well for him. He turns his head and closes his eyes and throws his right hand, hoping it will land. To his benefit, it does, and it does right on the point of the chin of Lennox Lewis and drops him and hurts him. And to your point, Mark, Lennox gets up. He had beaten the count of the referee seemingly has his wits about him, though a little bit hurt. But the referee, for whatever reason, decides, I've seen enough, I'm going to stop this fight. And award the knockout victory to Oliver McCall, as well as the WBC heavyweight title. And there's been some discussion over this over time. Did Don King have any influence over the referee to get his fighter a title? Was there something else? Was there, you know... We don't know. We can only operate on the assumption that the referee is operating on the level and what he saw from Lewis was enough to warrant stopping the fight. Lennox was not on 100% steady legs. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. But I also think he was cogent enough where if he's throwing his arms up in the air saying, what are you doing stopping this fight and can stand up on his own, he probably deserved to continue the fight let alone the fact that he was the champion going into this fight and beat the count and wasn't allowed to continue. Um, it was, you can call it a raw deal. I don't think that's out of line, but facts are facts. He didn't win, and Oliver knocked him down and took his title. And a lot of the, at that point, hype around Lewis kind of dissipated because the thought became, I don't know if this guy can take a punch. And as a heavyweight especially, if the thought is you can't take a punch, you're not seen as somebody who's going to last very long. Ain't that the truth? Well, everyone loves the comeback story, and this is Lennox Lewis 2.0. This is the rebuild part of his career. So many people wrote Lewis off after the loss, uh, but Lewis instead made changes to his camp, got back on that horse. Lewis would employ McCall's trainer, Emmanuel Stewart, and fire his previous trainer, Pepe Correa, best known for working with Sugar Ray Leonard from 1988 on, and Simon Brown. Correa and Lewis had seen increasing tension boil over with the McCall fight being the reason for their split. Correa was highly critical of Lewis in public after his firing, but did not go on to train another world champion. Stewart, meanwhile, openly expressed his desire to work with Lewis after the McCall fight, as he had seen great potential in Lewis and left McCall because of several personal issues, which would eventually halt McCall's career for several years. Yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, Lewis had several technical flaws that Stewart uh, worked to immediately correct. Lewis changed his jab from a pawing lazy left into an authoritative one to control distance. Uh, you're going to see a lot of that in the Holyfield fights. Instead of relying on his right cross, Stewart showed Lewis how to set up his left hook and use uppercuts on opponents closing inside of him. 
So his next fight, his uh, get well fight, if you will, is against Lionel Butler, who he TKOs in the fifth round on May 13th, 1995 in Sacramento. Um, he then goes on a three-fight tear. He fights Justin Fortune and knocks him, uh, does a TKO on him in four rounds in Dublin, Ireland. <laughs> he then fights poor Tommy Morrison. Oh, Tommy. <laughs> um, he TKOs poor Tommy in the sixth round in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and wins one of boxing's many useless titles, the IBC heavyweight title. Pat, you want to give me ten words or less on the IBC? In fact, I don't. Indeed. Uh, next up, as uh, 1995 turns to 1996 at uh, the Mecca of Sports Entertainment, Madison Square Garden, he goes to a majority decision against Ray Mercer. Uh, and then it was back to Oliver McCall again. And much like the Fan Man incident, this is one of those weirdo moments in boxing history that real boxing aficionados just much laugh at and like, what the hell happened here? So, Oliver McCall, who may or may not have gone into this fight with some mental health issues, to say the least, uh, gave, finally, gave Lennox Lewis his rematch on February 7th, 1997 in, uh, Las, in, at the Las Vegas Hilton in Nevada. And this was for, I guess, the vacant WBC heavyweight title, for whatever the reasons were. Um. Well, okay. Let, let's go into the reasons. Yeah, McCall had beaten Lewis for this title. McCall would lose this title to former Lewis victim Frank Bruno. Bruno would lose this title to a fresh out of jail Mike Tyson, whom had paid Lewis step aside money so that Tyson could unify this WBC title with the WBA title under the condition that after Tyson fought and assumedly defeated the WBA champion Bruce Seldon and held two belts, that Tyson's next fight would be against Lewis. Tyson instead chose to fight Evander Holyfield, and thus the WBC stripped him of said title and held it up to held to be decided between a meeting between the one and two contenders, which were at the time Lewis and McCall, who were both former champions. Got it. So, this weirdo fight. Yep. So, Lewis Good comes Lord. in, and he's jabbing, and he's hooking, and he's, you know, staying away from McCall, but he's giving him the business, and McCall keeps turning away from him and not wanting to fight, and he's putting up somewhat of a guard, he's, you know, pushing away punches, but he's not really fighting back, and this goes on for four rounds, at which point the referee says, do you not want to be here anymore? Do you want to go home, little boy? And he goes, no, and then starts to cry. He starts crying in the ring. His corner is utterly flabbergasted. The... The ringside commentators are besides themselves. They are ready to get in there and beat up Oliver McCall themselves. And at the start of the fifth round, he w Lennox Lewis would continue to punch him because that's what you do in a boxing match. And Oliver McCall will continue to minimally defend himself but not fight back. At which point the ref says, no moss, we're done here. And Lennox Lewis is awarded a TKO victory in the fifth round at almost a minute and awarded the WBC title. What happened to Oliver McCall before this fight and then after? Because he will go on to continue fighting, believe it or not, and he will have more wins than losses. He somehow pulls out of this. He never gets a serious like like world title fight again. But he, you know, people are throwing him various ridiculous belts hither and thither. Uh, he has a pretty decent career when it's all over, but he, but not without its struggle. So just a bit of a coda on Oliver McCall, Pat. Oliver suffered from an illness or disease that a lot of people from the late 80s into the 90s suffered from, and it was crack addiction. And unfortunately, this addiction got... A very strong hold of Oliver 
and didn't let go for a long time, arguably still hasn't let go in a certain respect. Um, he just could not shake that monkey off of his back and had a problem with crack cocaine addiction where he failed several drug tests, had to complete inpatient rehab, even after the fact would still test positive. Um, and even towards the end of his career, where he was you know, seemingly a viable heavyweight again out of nowhere in the mid-2000s making a run for himself, he would still fail a couple drug tests for uh, crack. And, you know, as someone, you know, Mark, you and I both grew up during the 80s where the crack epidemic was really kind of at its peak. Um, it was not uncommon to see very prominent people just go down to the illness of this disease because – it was a drug that was very cheap and very affordable that was very accessible for a lot of people. And, and very whereas addictive. cocaine was seen as kind of more the glamour drug of the two, crack was seen as the accessible fun drug of the two, and a lot of people fell into under its spell. Unfortunately for him, Oliver McCall was one of those people, and all of his potential to be a great heavyweight was seemingly washed away with that. Yeah, un it's unfortunate. Um, he, uh, you know, he certainly had his high moments here, but I feel like, especially in this era of boxing, there's been a couple of these stories, a couple of times now that we've had to talk about people who had great potential in the 90s heavyweight boxing scene, but fell to uh, their own demons and crack addiction, and, and it's an awful shame. Uh, meanwhile, Lennox Lewis will have his next two fights, one against... Henry Akinwande, which will uh, end a DQ in favor of Lennox Lewis after Akinwande disqualif was disqualified for repeated holding. And then he fought notorious dick puncher Andrew Galata on October 4th of 1997 at the Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City and demolished Galata in one round. Like... You watch Galata's fights, and yeah, he's got some pretty good ones. He's got some pretty awful ones, and then there's the ones where he can't stop punching you in the dick. This one made Andrew Galata look like he shouldn't have been in the ring with anybody, let alone another boxer. Holy cow. Lennox Lewis just took his lunch pat. Give me the 50 words or less on this one. Uh, I don't know that I can do 50 or less, but I'll try. <laughs> um, Galata at the time was seen as arguably the best heavyweight in the world because even though he had lost to Riddick Bowe on two, dis two disqualifications both for low blows before that he was very highly touted as potentially the future of the heavyweight division he was a big guy who could move who could punch who could take a punch was tough gritty this was a guy who was seen as, as really the future of the division and even with the disqualification against Bowe in the first fight because he was so dominant in that fight against such a great heavyweight People thought, this guy is the future. And, you know, he lost to Bo on the DQ. He lost the second fight to Bo on the DQ in what was seemingly the most improbable thing to happen. But he was still seen as dangerous and, and very, very much uh, a top heavyweight. So Lennox went in there looking to make a statement, and boy, did he ever, with just a dominant, aggressive display in the first round, hurts Galata, drops him. Beats the fight out of him from the outset. Um, and at the time, I was I was living in Jersey in a very heavily Polish community. And uh, the hype around uh, Galata was very real, especially among Polish people who thought he was the greatest thing in the second coming. And when Lewis just destroyed him and demolished him from the kids, all I heard were excuses along the lines of, oh, well, if... If Galata had been able to get up, he would have got him. But I was like, yeah, but he wasn't able to get up because he didn't want any more. And if my grandmother had will, she'd be a wagon. Lewis would follow this up by staking his claim as the lineal heavyweight champion by beating Shannon Briggs in five rounds and then defeating mandatory challenger Zel... Zilko Mavrovic. I was going to do the Mavrovic part. I, I knew Mavrovic. I couldn't get the first Zilko. one. Zilko. Zilko, got it. Zilko Mavrovic by a wide unanimous decision uh, at the Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City and the Mohegan Sun 
in Connecticut, respectively. Um, so that takes us to another title unification bout, this time with Evander Holyfield. And we talked about this on our Evander Holyfield episode. This one ends in a draw that should have ended, <laughs> that should have been uh, a unanimous decision win for Lennox Lewis. We talked a lot about this the last time. Do you want to go just um, go back to it in any way? Or you know, I, I like think we said enough. Let's just bullet point it. Basically, Holyfield held two out of three belts. Lewis held one belt and the lineal distinction. They met in Madison Square Garden. Lewis put on a performance that was dominant but unsatisfying to the crowd because it was very safety first, whereas Holyfield couldn't mount any type of sustained offense. So even though Lewis should have clearly won the fight, he did not. They scored a draw. And, you know, the reasoning being it led to a rematch. And we got to said rematch in November of the same year, shockingly. They didn't try to put it off or do something else. And in that fight, though, Holyfield was slightly more effective because Lewis took more chances. Lewis still very clearly won the fight and was correctly awarded this time the unanimous decision to become for the first time since... Uh, 1992, the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Yep. At the Thomas and Mack Center in Nevada, as you said, he wins a unanimous decision, unifies the titles, and is the last man to do so currently. Nobody has done it since. When AJ, uh, Anthony Joshua, and Tyson Fury finally, maybe, if they do, get in the ring... Uh, and managed to keep their belts along the way, the winner of that fight, provided it doesn't end in a draw, will be the first person to do it since November 13th, 1999. And a lot of the reason why is who we're going to talk about next on our next chapter, but we'll get there when we get there. Uh, suffice it to say, it's a pair of brothers who didn't want to fight each other for <laughs> <laughs> obvious reasons. Um, next up, Michael Grant, who he KOs in the second round in Madison Square Garden, retaining... The Unified World Championship. Uh, after that, he takes on Francis Bota. Uh, July 15th, 2000, knocks, uh, TKO's him in two rounds in the London Arena in England. And then, David Tua. He wins a unanimous decision on November 11th, 2000 at the Mandalay, event, uh, Mandalay Bay Event Center in Nevada, uh, retaining his unified world championship. Tell me about... Uh, partially unified. Partially unified. Tell me about... Uh, that's right, there's no WBA here anymore. Um, and hasn't been for... Pff, Jesus. <laughs> hasn't been since the Evander Holyfield fight. Whoops. Um, all right, so tell me about that, and then tell me about the David Tua fight. So the WBA, in its infinite wisdom, of course, uh, decided that its number one contender was a... Heavyweight by the name of John Ruiz, who had oh, not yeah. beaten anyone of note at this point in time, uh, with the exception of a very aged uh, t Tony Tucker. Um, in his most highly profiled fight, Ruiz had been beaten in 19 seconds by David Tua. So Tua, by this point in time, has staked his claim as arguably the best heavyweight in the world not named Lewis by beating guys like Ruiz, Oleg Maskaev, David Aizan, uh, Hasim Rahman, and, and several others in, in very devastating fashion. And at this point, uh, even though the WBA is mandating that, well, okay, you've fought in this guy. We are mandating that you need to fight John Ruiz or else we're going to strip you of your recognition as said champion. And Lewis got this memo and looked at it and looked at what he was going to make for fighting John Ruiz, looked at what he would make for fighting David Tua, and decided without any hesitation that he was going to fight the guy who had not only already blew out Ruiz in 19 seconds, but was also worth substantially more to him on paper, was going to allow him to, con to keep two of his three recognized world championships and go on about his life. And I don't think there was any fault in the decision-making by Lewis in that regard. 
Tua had, again, staked a very legitimate claim as the second best heavyweight in the world at this point with knockout victories over all the top contenders that he fought. Uh, And the only thing that was noticeable about Tua is that over the coming months towards this fight, he had taken on softer levels of opposition and in return had himself gotten a little bit softer in the midsection and not trained as hard, it seemed, for those fights. And... You know, now you're preparing to fight the best heavyweight in the world. Maybe you should be putting a little more work in than what you're doing. And while Tua did well for himself in the early rounds, Lewis gradually took over the fight and took the fight to Tua in an aggressive style where one of the things we didn't know about David Tua that would be exposed in this fight and later on is that David Tua does not punch when punched at. David Tua waits for his opponent to finish punching and will then come forward and try to punch in return. Mainly because David Tua did not like getting hit. He's one of those guys who just psychologically never dealt well with aggression and being hit multiple times. So what Lewis did was go after him in an aggressive style, landing a lot of right hands to the body, and then coming upstairs with the left behind it, really being dominant with a multi a multi-function jab in this fight. And one of the best performances of Lewis's career was this fight against David Tua, where he took on a very dangerous, viable contender who had the potential of knocking him out with a single shot and not completely dominating him over 12 rounds, but after the first four rounds of the fight, he really did take complete control of the fight and then really put a number on Tua, who he pursued aggressively, backed up, and beat up in the exchanges. And that was what was so impressive about this fight, to the point where in the in the aftermath with uh, the HBO interviewer, uh, they were like, Lennox, what was his problem? Lennox said, me. He's never seen a boxer like me who can do what I do, and I took it to him, and nobody disagreed with that sentiment. It's one of the more impressive performances of Lewis's career and of any heavyweight champion against the top-rated contender. So we said at the onset of this podcast that Lewis and Tyson were sort of opposite sides of the same coin. And it is around this time that Lennox Lewis is hunting Mike Tyson. He wants the Mike Tyson fight. He needs the Mike Tyson fight. He has to have... And he has to beat Mike Tyson for him to be seen the way he should be seen in the sport of kings. However, life never goes quite the way Lennox Lewis needs it to go. And we hit yet another bump in the road of his championship career. And it goes something like this. Uh, While trying to find a fight with Tyson, Lewis would become an actor for six months. During that time, Lewis accepted a movie role simulating a fight with heavyweight contender Vladimir Klitschko, for the film Ocean's Eleven. Lewis agreed to fight with top 10 ranked Hashim Rahman to take place in Johannesburg, South Africa. Lewis came into the fight grossly out of shape at a career high of 254 pounds. While in Africa, Lewis took time to visit Nelson Mandela and take part in several press tours. Emmanuel Stewart was critical, to say the least, of Lewis's preparation, but when the fight went on, uh, Rahman a 20 to 1 underdog shocked the world by launching a right hand missile that knocked Lewis out in the fifth round to take the title. And this time, there was no question about it. Uh, Lewis was on Queer Street. He didn't know math. He was done. Um, there was no controversy on that night. The fight was named 2001's KO and Upset of the Year. So your new WBC, IBF, and IBO for what that's worth, heavyweight champion Haseem Rahman with a KO in the fifth round on April 22nd, 2001 in South Africa. Anything else about that fight, Pat? So at the time, I was very much uh, in my boxing fandom, and a friend of mine was not. One of of my good friends who uh, I knew in Jersey when I would come visit on the weekends, I would hang out with. Um because I was still, bo- I was actually actively boxing at this time and re- really into the sport. And uh, I actually met Lennox Lewis back in uh, the summer of 2001 uh, after he had knocked out Francois Botha. And uh, so I told my friend, I was like, you know, this is this is the heavyweight champion of the world. It's a big deal. He's fighting on HBO, not pay per view. 
like we need to watch this and uh he was like eh, i guess he was kind of on the fence about it and uh I, he was asking me like oh does this other guy have a shot at beating him and i was like well he can punch really hard but you know i don't i don't think he'll beat lewis and then uh, I went to a website that's still active today called fightnews.com, and I looked at the weigh-in results, and I saw Lennox's weight, and I said, huh. <laughs> and he goes, what? I said, well, Lennox is really heavy compared to what he usually is. And he goes, so what does that mean? I said, well, if this fight kind of goes a little while, this isn't going to be good for him. And he goes, how do you figure? I said, well, the more weight you carry, it usually means the less hard you train, and the less hard you train, the longer you have to go, it's not a good mix. So... Through the first four rounds of this fight, it was a pretty even fight, which I don't think a lot of people saw coming. And when that happened, I think a lot of people's eyes were open to, I don't think Lennox is in shape. And sure enough, in the fifth round, he's being very lazy, and he kind of dogs it along the ropes, and Rockman pursues him aggressively and launches a oh, just beautiful overhand right over Lewis's low left hand and just drops him like a ton of bricks and... Counted, and this was not an Oliver McCall. I beat the count. I can go on. He did not beat this count. He was out for ten, and everybody who was watching, including myself, was in shock. And you know, my friend was like, "Oh my God, does this happen all the time?" I said, "No. That's why it's special. <laughs> you just watch history." And he was in disbelief by what he saw. So you know, I mentioned at the top of the program, this is one of my three big Lennox Lewis memories. And I feel bad that's not a very flattering Lennox Lewis memory, but it's one of the ones that sticks out to me as a result of, you know, what we saw. And it's one of those things you just don't forget. I think I had a very similar situation with Brock Lesnar and Alistair Overeem, where like I had invited people over um, and I was like, oh, my God, Brock Lesnar is, you know, former UFC champion, WWE wrestler. He's just the greatest. You know, Alistair Overeem is this uh, kickboxer. He was a heavyweight champion in a different organization. This is going to be amazing. And it was over within minutes after Brock Lesnar got kicked in the itis. And everyone's looking at me and I'm like, what? <laughs> it's just, I can't win. Every time I get excited for a fighter... Um, even like Deontay Wilder, you know, I was a Deontay Wilder Brewster, despite his lack of ability. And, you know, I was like, hey, look, I'm all for the homegrown American heavyweight champion. I want to I want to see, an, a, you know, an American heavyweight champion. And so I want Deontay Wilder to succeed. And then Tyson Fury knocks his head off. And at which point he goes on a tour of embarrassment, which we'll talk about in a couple of podcasts from now. Um, in any case, yeah, I, I get how you felt. Pat, I, I sympathize with your pain. Um, so, Lewis was contractually entitled to an immediate rematch. Rockman signed a deal with promoter Don King. He was courted by both HBO and Showtime for exclusive deals, but instead signed to fight Danish heavyweight Brian Nielsen. Lewis Brian. Began... Who? I'm not even kidding you. They pronounce his name Brian Nielsen. Brian Tamara? Got it. Um, yes. Lewis began pursuing his rematch in court. And this is important to understand what's going to happen next. <laughs> it's very important you understand that these two had to go to court and someone got a little pissy because of it. And Rachman's defense against Nielsen fell through, leading him to negotiating to fight with David Izon. After Izon pulled out, the court mandated that he follow through on his rematch with Lewis, televised by HBO Pay-Per-View. This led to a promotion interview on ESPN. And we're going to do something we don't normally do on this. We're going to play a clip for you. Here is the clip from the ESPN interview. We just going to we're play a clip. Gigs here. Uh, did he question your sexuality? <laughs> yeah, he, he, he said, uh, why are you starting that gay sh uh, stuff? I'm saying, I'm not gay. Why are you calling me gay? He said he's not calling me gay. So I don't understand that. What did you say, I see? I said what he did was gay. I said he wanted to take it to the court. And we fighting that around the same time I told him we were going to fight anyway. So I said that was gay to take it to the court. I mean, if he, I don't know why he was so offended. <laughs> I'm a 100% woman's man, so don't even play that. If, if you're worried about that, bring, bring his sister, bring anyone. No, hold on. 
I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't want me saying nothing about your mother, your father, or anybody else in your family, Listen, do not say nothing about my family. Be careful what you do say. Do not say nothing about my family. Be careful what you say to me. Do not say nothing. Man, careful. you ain't nobody. I say what I want to say to you. Go ahead, man. I say what I want to say to you. What you mean? I'll be sad. What you want me to say? Say what you want me to say. Same thing. Like what? Like what? Like what? Anything you want. Like what? Anything what you want me to say. Same thing you want. What? This goes on for another minute, by the way. These two, all over each other, just just a fussing and a fighting. These two idiots. I mean, Lennox Lewis is a bright guy. They talk about him being like a chess player, being, you know, very well spoken. Uh, very, he presents himself well in public. But this was not his finest moment. And if you watch the clip, he's actually the one that starts the brawl. He, because, you know, Rock, you know, it's so funny because, like, you shouldn't have to parse out an argument this stupid. <laughs> but, but Rockman actually wasn't, I mean, his choice of words, especially in the, in a 2021 context, not the greatest, but basically what he's, he's calling Lennox Lewis a pussy and Lennox Lewis, you know, and Lennox Lewis, because he's using the term gay, gay, meaning you're a pussy, you're a wimp, um, for bringing me to court when we were going to, we were going to fight. So there was no reason to do this. You're taking the wimpy way out. Lennox Lewis utterly misinterprets what he's saying and, in, in, and actually saying like, you're saying that I'm a homosexual. Well, I'm not a homosexual. I like women. I have a huge case of the not gays. And it's like, you watch that, and you, all you can do is hold your head like, wow, I'm not sure which one of you is the dumber, of, 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 of but you're both pretty dumb. And then it turns into, don't talk about my family. Well, don't talk about my family. I'll say whatever the fuck I want. And it just deteriorates from there, at which point they stand up and they go nose to nose. And Lennox Lewis is the first one that pushes, at which point Rockman defends himself and they go spilling all over the studio. And there's all these white people. Oh! Ah! Stop! It's just ridiculous, Pat. It's so bad. Um, this, might be my fa- this might be my favorite dumb moment in the history of boxing. I mean, you got to remember, too, at the time, boxing did not get a ton of coverage on ESPN at this point in time other than the Friday Night Fight Show on ESPN2. So to see boxing in a mainstream light and presented was very big. But to see it go through these stages, (laughs) um, it was one of those alternatively, I don't know if this was good or bad. Um, It was good in the sense that it brought a lot of eyes to the upcoming heavyweight title rematch. It was bad in the sense that it was fucking silly on all counts <laughs> as it went down um <laughs> I, I like this was about as ridiculous as it got between heavyweights since we had seen larry holmes run off a car and try to drop kick trevor burbick in a parking lot <laughs> um, yeah this is this is not not a good luck as they say as the kids say anyway um these two idiots finally got in the ring on November 17th, 2001, at the Mandalay Bay Event Center um, for the uh, WBC, IBF, and IBO heavyweight titles. And Lennox Lewis would have his revenge in four rounds with a vicious KO. So, before we move on to the main event, uh, we are almost at the end of Lennox Lewis's entire uh, career here. Um... What do you have to say about this second uh, fight with uh, Rachman? What we thought the first should have been, um, more than likely, just a a guy who was a much better class of fighter going in and doing what should have been done the first time had he actually applied himself. And that's no disrespect to Rachman. Rachman was a good fighter, but he was just in there with elite competition who didn't take him seriously and took advantage of it. In this fight, when you saw what happens when a guy actually trains for said fight and is motivated, Rachman really didn't stand a chance. And what we got was uh, while Rachman had such a great knockout the first time with that one right hand, the right hand bomb that Lewis laid on him in this fight that left him perfectly positioned in the corner under the Don King logo in this fight was just equally as brutal. And um, 
it was one of those things where we didn't need to see a rubber match after because we kind of knew this fight pretty much laid the claim as to who was the real deal out of these two guys. So he's the ch- minus the WBA, he's the champion again. And it, it's Tyson or nobody at this point. Uh, they finally came to terms. The uh, fight was originally scheduled for April of 2002, but ultimately was postponed as Nevada, of all places, where prostitution's legal, was unwilling to grant Mike Tyson a boxing license. And it's because well, Nevada of has morals. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean... There was a, there, I mean, at this point, we had had the biting incident and Tyson's behavior. Uh, he he was partially leaning into the public persona character that he had created. Uh, part of it was his own actual mental illness, which we've detailed at length in the Mike Tyson podcast. You can go back and listen to that. But um, Mike Tyson just went above and beyond in trying to promote this fight. He made himself look like the ultimate heel, while Lennox Lewis looked like the ultimate good guy. And the public, uh, which you can always count on to pick the right man, was cheering for Tyson. Because I'll fuck you till you love me, faggot, uh, is right up there with my country, tis of the sweet land of liberty. Holy cow. <laughs> Perhaps the greatest line ever uttered by anyone ever. <laughs> I've often said I've often said it to women trying to pick them up in a bar and I can't tell you how successful it's been. It was. Uh, so anyway, Rival Network Showtime and HBO, which represented Challenger and Champion, agreed on a split of the revenue and each featured their contracted up and uh, up and coming fighters Manny Pacquiao and Joel Kazmaier uh, on the undercard. Tyson would be introduced by Showtime ring announcer Jimmy Lennon, Lewis by Michael Buffer. While Tyson had always been contracted to wear Everlast gloves in order to fight the champion, he wore Reyes gloves as mandated by Lewis. And we talked about this on the Tyson podcast, but uh, it bears repeating. The, I mean, these two got into a brawl in a face-off, a, a photo op face-off for the press because Tyson got off his pedestal and just walked up to... Lennox Lewis, they started fussing and fighting, and at one point, Tyson was biting him on the thigh like you do. Because why not? (laughs) Nothing says, buy my pay-per-view, like, ah! So, things are at a fever pitch, to say the least, and poor Lennox Lewis is like, I just want to be a boxer, and Tyson's like, I'm going to kill your children. All right, maybe we need to have extra security. And so there was. And so, there's this line of CSC security dudes standing shoulder to shoulder in a diagonal line across the ring. And there's Tyson, short-ass Tyson, trying to look over their shoulder, going, I'm going to get you! I mean, there aren't many moments in the history of boxing anywhere as surreal as this one. Um, This was a sight to behold. In any case, Lewis had something to prove here. He couldn't just win this one by decision. He had to knock Tyson out. There could be no controversy. There could be no question. In order to make the world see Lennox Lewis for the greatness that he was, he had to put Tyson on his ass. And so he did. At the Pyramid in Memphis, Tennessee, home of Jerry Lawler, he KO'd Iron Mike Tyson in eight rounds. Retaining the WBF, IBF, IBO, and ring heavyweight titles. Put a coda on this one for me. What we ended up seeing was basically uh, substance over style. And that Lewis had a lot more on the tank left at this point in his career than Tyson did. And from a style matchup standpoint, this was as bad a matchup as you can see from Tyson against an aggressive boxer puncher who was going to limit what Mike did well and push him and push him back and bully him and out muscle him and out punch him quite frankly on the inside and any public perception that was left of Mike Tyson was basically defeated in this fight which should have been the crowning achievement for Lennox and unfortunately because it wasn't um, in, in a lot of respects people came up with oh Mike was past his prime or anything 
Lewis wasn't exactly a spring chicken in this fight either. Lewis was well beyond his years as a top heavyweight realistically as well, but he was still doing it. Um, so for me personally, I feel like this was a great win for Lewis, despite people trying to tear it down. And even if it wasn't the, the, the Tyson of 1986, it was the best Tyson that was left, and nobody else was fighting him. And Lennox did, and he beat him comprehensively. A rematch was set to take place, as was the potential of Tyson fighting on a Lewis undercard to set up said rematch. However, Lewis accused promoter Don King, like you do, of interfering with negotiations and sued him for $300 million because who hasn't Probably sued Don wrong. King? <laughs> who hasn't sued Don King at this point? I Gary, haven't, but what the hell? Let's throw my hat in the ring. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, the line forms to the left. During this time, the IBF, like they do, mandated that Lewis fight their number one challenger, Chris Bird. But Lewis refused and instead tried to pursue the Tyson rematch. This resulted in Lewis being stripped of the IBF title, like you do. Oh, no. Um, so when it became clear that the fight's not going to happen... Lewis agreed to fight Kirk Johnson in June of 2003. Johnson was a fringe contender who had unsuccessfully challenged WBA champion John Ruiz a year prior, losing on a highly controversial disqualification. The plan was to fight Johnson with Vitaly Klitschko fighting on the undercard to set up a December showdown between Lewis and Klitschko. Uh, Johnson was not thought of highly, and the WBC, the lone sanctioning organization recognizing Lewis as champion, did not recognize the bout as a championship fight. Only three weeks out from the fight, Johnson pulled out with an injury, and Lewis and Klitschko agreed to fight each other on short notice, like you do. While Klitschko opened as a 4-1 to underdog, Lewis was seemingly un- underprepared while being ready for Johnson as he came in at a career high of 257. Klitschko came in at almost 10 pounds lighter and was also two inches taller than Lewis and looked to be in great condition. With the change of opponent, the WBC woke up from its slumber and chose to recognize this fight as a title fight. Yay! Much of the public perception of Klitschko was negative, as in his highest profile fight against American Chris Bird, Klitschko was well ahead on the scorecards before quitting after the ninth round due to a shoulder injury that turned out to be a torn rotator cuff. Vitali was largely called a quitter and dismissed as not having a fighting heart. More on that in our next podcast. In this fight, Klitschko would redeem himself in a losing effort. Klitschko came out aggressively. Take it away, Pat. What happened in this fight? So I I can very personalize this fight. Um, Do you you mind if I go off on a little bit of a story time, Mark? Please do, Pat. Your stories are the best. So the year is 2003, as we've established. The date is June 21st. Lennox Lewis is defending the heavyweight championship of the world on regular HBO, not pay-per-view, against Vitaly Klitschko, who, while a lot of people have written him off, people in boxing circles know this guy is about as dangerous as it gets. This fight is for free. It's on HBO. I'm staying with relatives at the time because Pops is on a bender, shock. And these relatives, while they weren't very very uh, upfront about you know wanting to shell out for pay-per-view fights... HBO they had so this was a fight I was going to get to see as it happened and there may not have been a Lennox Lewis fight I had been more excited for including Tyson than this because I think people in the know saw Vitaly Klitschko as a much more dangerous opponent than Mike Tyson was so the date is June 21st 2003 however early in the day a bomb gets dropped on me myself my younger cousin Maddie we're going to be traveling with his parents to a graduation party in a, uh, not quite upstate New York, but the Hudson Valley area. And I'm like, in my head, okay, well, we can go to this party, what have you. And the fight doesn't start until about 10 p.m. on HBO. That's plenty of time to get back and see the fight. Everything's going to be just fine. Now, my older cousin John does not have to go because my you know, my aunt and uncle, his parents have essentially given up on trying to make him do anything, so he gets to stay home. And good Lord, I was jealous of that because, my God, all I wanted in life while things are going terrible is to see this fight. That's all I want. So we go to this graduation party. It's Now, keep in mind, it's an outdoor party. It starts pouring rain. 
Do they cancel the party or anything? No. They have tents set up in the backyard to sit under, and there's, you know, we, we spend most of the day inside the house playing Grand Theft Auto Vice City on PlayStation 2, and I hang out with, you know, some guys who I had met, you know, twice or three times in my lifetime and whatever. But mind you, I'm looking at the clock the whole time and figuring out, oh my goodness, can can I make this fight? Are we going to see this fight? Time gets to about 9.30, 9.45. And finally, my aunt and uncle are like, okay, we're going to leave. But we're going to stay in a hotel. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, good Lord, okay, first of all, that's better because if we left to try to go home, there's no way we're making it home by the time this fight's going to happen. But if we get to a hotel there's the chance that we can, you know, get somewhere where there's HBO and I can watch this fight. My God, there's a chance. So we drive, and my uncle's had a couple, shockingly. Doesn't really know where he's going. Finally, as we're low on gas, he pulls into a gas station and goes to take a leak. And as such, since he's not in the car, my aunt correctly asked the gas station for advice on to where there is a hotel to stay. They tell her there's a Howard Johnson's about a half mile up the road on the right-hand side. Okay, great. I'm like, a half a mile? That's nothing. We can get there. We can get there in time. It's going to be fine. Rather than immediately go to the Howard Johnson, my uncle argues with my aunt about which way to go and which way the hotel is. And we spend about 45 minutes trying to get there. (laughs) I'm still hopeful. My God, I'm still hopeful. Because some hotels at this point in time still have what's called HBO West Coast. And even if I don't see the fight live, there's a chance I could see it without ruining the ending, that I could see this fight happen, and okay, let's go, let's get ready for it. So we finally end up at this Howard Johnson's. We we get to Howard Johnson's, and we check in, and my aunt and uncle have a room, and me and my little cousin have a room. We get in. He turns the TV on. Whoever had last viewed said television had left it on HBO regular. And I happened to just see the end credits of what was Lewis Klitschko with Jim Lampley's voiceover telling me that Lewis had won this fight on a sixth round TKO on cuts. (laughs) Oh, you poor kid. And so I proceeded to go into the bathroom of said hotel room and I put my fist through a wall. Oh, Jesus, Pat. (laughs) Put my fist just straight through the wall because, quite frankly, the graduation party we went to, we had no idea or care who was graduating. It wasn't something myself or even my cousin Maddie, for that matter, should have been to because we didn't know or care. So why are you dragging us to this? All I wanted was to see said fight. On top of that, in hindsight, it's the last fight of the career of Lennox Lewis that I did not get to see live. Let's go a little bit further and talk about the fact that it was a tremendous fight. (laughs) This is one of the best heavyweight championship fights of all time. I don't say that with hyperbole. I say that because you had a six foot seven. 250 pound giant and six foot five, 250 pound giant go head to head and right at it with each other for six incredible rounds. And I always will remember this fight for the most negative reasons possible first. <laughs> Because everything was thrown into my way to not allow me to see this fight as it happened when that's literally all I wanted. Literally all I wanted was that. And I was denied that. So you know what? Fist went through a wall in the bathroom of a Howard Johnson. The next day, I wake up, I shower, I'm a malcontent. I have to sit through some long, you know, hour and a half recording of a Dean Martin live show in the car. And we drive back to Brooklyn from whatever hellhole of the Hudson Valley we were in. And I, we get back to the house and all I see is a couch with baby powder all over it and 
a wreck of a house that my cousin threw a party in the night prior and of course was caught and nothing came of it and he's telling me man did you see that fight oh god (laughs) and at that point I took a swing at him now he got out of the way but just to illustrate this at the time I was probably about 5 foot 8 about 160 pounds my cousin was about 5'10", but about 211, 212 pounds. And I just carelessly took a swing at him for saying that. And he got out of the way, said, what the F, and took a swing back at me that I got out of the way of. And I said, no, I didn't get to see the damn fight because your damn parents dragged into this damn party that you didn't have to go to and went off on pretty much an incredible tangent. And, uh, yeah, I was not happy, let it be known. And to this day, this is a fight I look at with reverence and disgust all at the same time. Because, my God, all I wanted in life was to see this fight. And every single obstacle thrown at me possible was put there, and I did not get to see it. I know, you know, 20-some-odd years later... This is a small consolation, but there's like a million fights this weekend. Um, there's Joseph Parker versus uh, Junior Fa, which is like one o'clock in the morning on DAZN, but it's a heavyweight fight, so I'm interested. There's Stephen Ward versus uh, Kem Shybek Kunyabayev on ESPN Plus, which is like nine o'clock in the morning. I think it's taking place somewhere in the East Asia. There's um, something on the Fight Network. There's Anthony Durrell versus Kyrone Davis on Fox in prime time. Um, on the UFC has a fight at Rosenstreich versus Gain. And then, yeah, Mark, how many, how many of those fights involve the undisputed uh, heavyweight champion of the world and the best hang, fighter of an entire decade? Hang on, against... I'm getting there. I'm getting there. And then finally, the top it all off is Cane- is uh, Canelo versus whoever is IBF mandatory or not IBF, whatever his um, current mandatory is for whatever belt he's got. So Canelo is fighting this Saturday night and again, small consolation, not nearly the epic tale you just told, but small consolation. Just going to share my pain with you. All I wanted to do was watch all of these fights. That's, That's it. But not only do I have to work, but instead of coming home to at least catch the Canelo fight like you do, I'm being dragged into the next county because your friend and mine, John's in town, and we're seeing him uh, at a bar somewhere in Orlando. So I get it, kind of. <laughs> no, I don't think you do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's fair. All right, Pat, let's 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 turn the page here. Uh, as you mentioned, yeah, six round TKO of Vitaly Klitschko at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. Um, at which point, here's what happens uh, next. Um, Lewis uh, announced his retirement shortly thereafter in February of 2004 to pursue other interests, including sports management and music promotion, and he vacated the title. Lewis and another said, thing, Mark. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, sir. I had friends coming up to me the following day when I got back to the area who were not even boxing fans coming up to me and saying, man, did you see that fight last night? Oh, Jesus Christ, Pat. I really feel bad for you. Like, I know that was 20 years ago, but I still like, eh. it's like, I get it. Um, it's kind of, I, 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 and I could see like people pouring salt in the moon as they're walking up to you and you're like, did you see the fight? No, for fuck's sake, I didn't see the fight. I'm... I get home, take a shower. <laughs> Get, get my clothes on and I'm going to go out and it's a rainy it's a rainy day the next day and it's fine it's a Sunday I don't care I just want to go out and forget about you know the day that was the day prior and first friend I run into my buddy Evan Bernstein and Evan says hey man did you see that fight <laughs> and it took all of my restraint not to take a swing at Evan Bernstein because I loved Evan Bernstein that's a good guy that's still a good guy and my God, I just wanted to hit him. 
we, we, how, couple, how often do you watch that fight? Later, we run, we run into Jimmy Gaffio, and Jimmy Gaffio says, hey, did you guys see that fight on HBO last night? <laughs> These are not guys who regularly watched fights. Everybody in the world but you saw the fight live, huh? It would appear so. <laughs> Poor bastard. Um, how many times have you watched the fight since then? Like, do you do, you, do you, like monthly twice. viewings, annual viewings? Really, only twice, huh? Only twice. All right. So he wanted to p- pursue music, uh, sports management, music promotion. Vacated the title. Uh, he said he would not return to the ring at his retirement. Lewis's record was forty-one wins, two losses, one draw, and thirty-two wins by knockout. Lewis worked as a boxing analyst for HBO on Boxing After Dark from 2006 until 2010. Which, boy, he was not good at. I feel like he's currently working for PBC. Um, he is. Boy, is he not good at it. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't stand out. Um, in 2000, Lewis appeared on Reflection Eternal's debut album, Train of Thought, giving a shout-out on the track, Down for the Count. Uh, in 2001, Lewis had a role in the film Ocean's Eleven, which we talked about before, where he boxed, quote-unquote, Vladimir Klitschko. In 2002, Lewis was reportedly offered a lot of money by the WWE to take up professional wrestling in his industry. His camp held discussions over a possible match with Brock Lesnar in February of 2003 at the No Way Out pay-per-view event. Prior to the offer, Lewis, is, Lewis was familiar with wrestling. He was part of the famous match held in the old Wembley Stadium between the British Bulldog and, Hit- and Brett the Hitman Hart uh, at SummerSlam 92, representing the Bulldog during his entrance while bearing a Union flag. Oh, God, I barely remember that. Uh, 2002, Lewis played himself on an episode of The Jersey called It's a Mad, 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 Mad Jersey. In 2003, Lewis made a brief cameo appearance in the Jennifer Lopez and LL Cool J video All I have and I'll tell you what Pat if you ever want to go listen to that song after you've heard if you've seen the video and you've seen Lennox Lewis in it and you want to listen to that song it's on the album This Is Me by Jennifer Lopez and did you know that This Is Me Then by Jennifer Lopez which came out November 19th 2002 is on Amazon Prime yes I did not know that. Is that the same album that has the video where Affleck is uh, patting her backside? It it just might be. It has great songs on it like Still and The One, the aforementioned Jenny from the Block with Jada Kiss and Styles P. Um, so if you want to listen to that album, you can go to Amazon.com. And as a matter of fact, if you click on our link here, get AmazonMusic.com slash W2M Network, you can sign up for a free 30 days of Amazon Music on us. Check out... You might have to just listen to that album. Absolutely. You can check out all the great offerings they have on Amazon Music. And if you like the service, you stick with it. You get all that streaming music. You never have to buy a physical album as long as you live. It's fantastic. Um... Works just like Spotify, only better. AmazonMusic.com Anyway, uh, in 2006, he appeared in the movie Johnny Was with Vinnie Jones. Lewis played in the World Series of Poker in 2006 and 2007. Uh, He didn't win any money, but, you know, that's what happens. Lewis appeared on NBC's Celebrity Apprentice in 2008, coming fourth out of 14. Um... He did some PCAs for domestic violence or against domestic violence. In 2011, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario. Um, He's a supporter of the West Ham United. And on May 18th, uh, on May 24th, 2018, Lewis was part of an Oval Office ceremony to announce the pardon of boxer Jack Johnson. He is regarded by many as one of the greatest heavyweight boxers of all time and one of the greatest British fighters of all time. In 1999, he was named Fighter of the Year by Boxing Writers Association of America, as well as BBC Sports Personality of the Year. BoxRec currently ranks Lewis as the 35th greatest pound-for-pound fighter of all time, as well as the 7th greatest European fighter of all time, and 4th greatest British fighter of all time. And the aforementioned last man to hold a unified heavyweight title in over 20 years. So, Lennox Lewis, you know, 
just one of again one of those guys where I don't think history has been as kind to him as he deserves. A uh, great athlete, great champion. You know, stumbled hither and thither, but uh, came up with class and dignity. And I think somebody that we should all respect. And I'm glad to have talked about him for the past hour and a half. Pat, I'll give you the final word. One of the very few men to have ever defeated everybody he ever faced in a ring. And I think that's especially impressive in the era he fought in. That even the guys who scored wins against him, he fought them again and beat them, thus leaving his record one of having beaten everybody he ever fought. Um, Again, we talk about the deepness of certain eras of heavyweight boxing. If the 60s or 70s was the best, the 90s was not far behind it with names like Tyson Ruddock, Bo, Holyfield, and Lewis established himself as the best of that bunch and of a very deep era. Hey, don't forget the returning George Foreman. Again, yeah, let's throw in George Foreman. Let's throw in guys who didn't win the title. Let's throw in guys like Ray Mercer, Tommy Morrison. Let, let's throw in a very deep class of, of fighters who were very good in a, a plethora of talent in an era, and Lewis far and away was the best of them and beat the other guys who were claiming to the best, except for one who refused to fight him. And so, really, where did that get Riddick Bow? Nowhere, that's where. It, it really did get him nowhere. Um, but to that end, not only did he beat the majority of these guys, he beat the majority of them in dominant fashion, via knockouts or just completely one-sided decisions if they were able to last that long with him. And the biggest knocks against Lewis were just how he was marketed. You shouldn't have seen him in a commercial where he's be, he's battering a sparring partner and then has to stop for high T. That was not the right way to market the heavyweight champion of the world. And I get the idea was to market him as the, uh, the anti-Tyson in many respects. But the fact of the matter is people wanted a Tyson. People want, in their heavyweight champion, they're always going to want a destroyer who mauls people and can then make you laugh on a talk show when he sits down, but they don't want the guy who's going to make you laugh in a commercial or anything involving his persona about what he does in the ring. They don't want a chess player in the ring. They want a destroyer of man. And Lewis utilized his chess skills to destroy men in the ring. The fact that he was marketed so poorly around it is a shame because it detracted from his greatness in the time he was doing it. In hindsight, I think he's gotten more credit deservedly so but I still don't think he's gotten enough and I don't know that he ever will to be fair that's where we're going to leave it tonight Uh, our next chapter our final chapter before the epilogue modern times we have one more chapter to go we have to talk about the Klitschko brothers Pat give us 50 words or less what can we expect from the career of the Klitschko brothers other than we're not fighting each other and therefore there'll be no unified champion (laughs) a mixed bag of a dominant era against nondescript opposition, but in dominant fashion with varied opinions. This is going to be an interesting episode because the division of opinion on both Vladimir Vitali and both guys as a whole is so strong one way or another that we're going to take a deep dive into where exactly, you know, we stand and where things should stand. Controversial opinion out there. We'll discuss it. Did the Klitschko's kill boxing, or at least heavyweight boxing, for a decade? We'll find out next month when we talk Chapter 16, The Klitschko Era, here on the History of Heavyweight Boxing. In the meantime, in between time, um, I have done nothing but podcasts lately. Oh my god, I swear. Oh really? I hadn't noticed. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Um, Two podcasts a day, it's getting to be a bit much. Uh, Earlier today, myself and Robert Winfrey reviewed I Care A Lot, featuring uh, Golden Globe nominee Rosamund Pike, and everyone's favorite midget, Peter Dinklage. Uh, Check it out if you have a chance. We had a fun talk about it. Uh, Last night, myself and Sean Comer put the Refn follow-up to Drive Only God Forgives on trial. Before that, myself and the Podsman talked The Elimination Chamber 2021. Um... On Tuesday night, myself, Robert Winfrey, and Jesse had a three-hour therapy session uh, that was centered around the Ed Brubaker and Refn collaboration miniseries, 13-hour movie, 
they like to call it, Too Old to Die Young. And we kicked off the week talking about Scene of the Crime by Ed Brubaker, probably the least strangest thing I've talked about this week. It's just a straight-up crime noir comic book. It was fantastic. Uh, next week is all Tom and Jerry all night long, except for when it isn't. We've got the Rough and Ready show on Source Material, which is one of those one of those uh, comics that Pat and Ronnie Adams love, where they take the old Hanna Barbera ones and make them, you know, gay gothic playwrights in the '60s, and they're hanging themselves, and they're polyamorous, and all kinds of fun stuff, you know. I hope this world burns. <laughs> Speaking of which. On Damn You, Hollywood, uh, myself, Alexis Hannah, and Robert Winfrey will be talking the new Tom and Jerry movie that is being split between theatrical release and HBO Max. The Metal Hammer of Doom returns, and it talks metal, actual metal. We're talking Epica, their new album, Omega. Uh, I'm going to take a much-needed night off, and David Wright is going to take over, like Rover. And him and Robert Winfrey are going to talk all four of the Next Generation movies. First Contact, Generation, Insurrection, etc. On Friday the 5th, I got another double header ahead of me. First, myself and Robert Winfrey are doing a Damn You Hollywood for Boss Level. uh, Starring Frank Grillo, which is coming directly to Hulu. And then... Myself and Jason Teasley will be doing another Damn You Hollywood for the Coming to America sequel, Coming to America, with the number two, not the word two. Uh, That'll be exclusively on Amazon Prime, at least here in America. And then on Saturday, we're going to get up bright and early. My kids and I are going to watch the 1992 Tom and Jerry the movie where they talk, they talk, they fly now. (laughs) <laughs> and we're going to do my son's favorite thing to do. We're going to do a commentary where we talk over the movie and my son can make funny jokes and I won't yell at him. So that'll be fantastic. That's all coming up in the next week. And you can find all the previous podcasts in the archives on the Rattle and Broadcasting Network on W2M. Mark, uh, for goodness sake, if you don't hit him while he's making comments during the movie, he'll never learn you're not supposed to do that. Yeah, you got to hit him with a sack of oranges. That way you don't leave bruises. You know, DCF will get involved. Um... You got anything going on besides working these these boxing podcasts with me? No. Terrific. Pat, always a pleasure. Glad to have you again. Well, wait, for- wait are, are we not going to plug what we have coming next? I did. The Klitschko Show. No, but I mean, I mean, aside from that, we have we have other projects we're working on. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, the week of WrestleMania will be debut, or the week that we review WrestleMania, right after WrestleMania... WrestleMania is the 10th and the 11th. We will be doing a show called The Mania of WrestleMania, where Pat and I do a deep dive into each of the 30 aught uh, WrestleManias that have taken place, starting with the first one, and that'll be mid April. So we've got that going on. And uh, we have our epilogue of the uh, history of championship boxing at the end of April, and then starting in May. We will continue our look at the history of boxing, but uh, looking at different career retrospectives, different rivalries. Uh, The very first one is the Fab Four. Roberto Duran, Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, and Thomas Hearns. So you can look forward to that in May. All right, now I got everything, right? Now I think you're good. All right, it's terrific. Once again, Pat, always a pleasure. Uh, Can't wait to talk to you again. For the rest of you, I'm Mark, he's Pat Mullen. Be well, be safe, and behave.